Number two song <laughs> that comes on TV. Dude, I've actually had two number one songs. What? The Lost Boy was a number one song. Where? Actually, I've had three number one songs. I have one in Australia too. I've had three number one songs worldwide. Let's put that in there. Greg has had three number one songs worldwide, including the Philip Phillips song, Home. Including Let's just do that. Philip Phillips. God, have I had four? I wonder if I had four. I had a number one, I think, in Suriname. <laughs> I've never, I don't even know where that is. And I think maybe like Iraq or Afghanistan, it was somewhere Middle East. It was serious? on Chart, Met- Chart Metric, told me. Yeah. It's like a Apple Music amazing. number one. That's amazing. Pretty big in the Middle East. I'm pretty. <laughs> good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to Dropped, a podcast hosted by two dreamers from the north of England. We cross paths in Los Angeles, California, where we quickly discovered that our journeys in the music industry are strikingly similar. We've tasted some success, but in the five years since that first meeting, our industry has transformed into something that we barely recognize, where our past lessons rarely apply and where making a living gets tougher each and every year. At this crossroads, we face a choice. Do we accept defeat or do we adapt, evolve, embrace new technologies and forge a new path ahead? We named our podcast Dropped as we intend to break what is usually a taboo subject and shine some light on the epidemic of artists who are signed and dropped by major record labels, sometimes losing the rights to their music forever and then often being legally bound to never speak of it again. But this podcast is not just for musicians. It's for anyone sacrificing everything for something that they care about. It's for all of those who face setbacks or being told to give up. And for anyone questioning if achieving a dream is even possible. Uh, My name is Greg Holden. I'm a singer, songwriter and producer originally from Lancashire in the UK, but currently living in Portland, Oregon via years long stints in New York City and Los Angeles. Much happier up here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. And I am Matt Belmont, a singer, songwriter and frontman for the band Belmont, currently living in London, UK and songwriting between London, Nashville and LA. Welcome to episode one of Dropped. Well, I better introduce my co-host Greg Holden, a man who would never tell you all of this himself. He's way too modest. I've had three number one songs worldwide. Let's put that in there. Greg's had three number one songs worldwide including the Philip Phillips song home. Um, He's toured extensively across the world. He's even played with artists such as Brandy Carlisle. Uh, He's had his songs on TV and film. He had a song in the hit TV show Sons of Anarchy. And my favourite of all the Greg Holden factoids is that Tom Hanks is a fan. Do you think Tom will be listening? I think Tom is for sure listening to our new podcast, Matt. Well, Matt would tell you this, but I'm going to do it instead. Um, He happens to be one of my favorite musicians and people, hence why we have a podcast together. I just get to hang out with him every week now. His band Belmont is one of my favorite bands and has actually amassed over 65 million streams online um, and had two top 40 AAA radio hits in the US. Belmont is also open for bands like Kaleo, Rag & Bone Man, The Revivalists, and the one and only Macklemore. He hosts a fan community on Patreon, uh, has five sold out music NFT collections, and I don't even know what NFT collections are. And has hosted one of the first ever VR song launches in the metaverse. Nerd alert. Nerd alert. Um, all that said, very happy to be here with Matt, my good friend and confidant. inspirational confidant. <laughs> Welcome to episode one of our podcast. Let's get to it. Yeah, let's do it. So here we are, episode one of our new podcast. Matt and I have been trying to figure out what to say in this podcast for a few weeks, and we've actually, truth be told, shot uh, three intro episodes. And as we've done that, we sort of learned a little bit about what we are trying to say. And originally, I think we were both just mad at the music industry and wanted to be two lads who have been signed and dropped um, and chewed up and spat out by the industry. Um, we just were sort of complaining. And, and I, I can complain real easily. I'm from the north of England, and Matt himself is a bit more optimistic. And so as we've been shooting episode one over and over, it's evolved into a much more positive outlook and a much more, uh, what's the word, Matt? Focused process for us both. Because now I think what we've, we've turned into something that we can actually work on and work towards, which has surprisingly become actually quite inspiring for me. <laughs> <laughs> Am I up? <laughs> We're trying to do something that's 
forward looking and we've gone from kind of like episode one, attempt one, two white guys have a FaceTime call and think it should be a podcast. And there's not much substance there. <laughs> it's just complaining. <laughs> And then episode two, well, why don't we just do what everyone else does and we'll just become the instructional podcast on how to be an indie musician because we've got a lot of experience in that, you know, we've experimented in a lot of ways. We've been through a few iterations of the music industry, you know, Greg in his time has nailed YouTube. I in my time have nailed Spotify and now we're at this point where we're trying to work out TikTok reels, short form, all the kind of the new ways to reach an audience. Um, so we thought maybe we will just instruct people on what we find with that. But then we thought of other podcasts that are hosted by people doing a great job at that. And we thought, well, we don't need another one of those. Like we already know which direction we'd point listeners in to find that out. One of those would be How to Break an Artist by Alfie from Hudson Taylor and uh, Fiannan, his co-host. And another one would be How to Make It in the New Music Industry by Ari Herstand. It's hard to kind of find a space between those and we don't really... The whole reason we're doing this is to push ourselves out of our comfort zones and into uncharted waters and to document a process of recovery, I suppose, to bruised independent artists who've been through the the industry machine and uh kind of found ourselves closed off from it we both yeah. were signed to the same major label out of la and we were both dropped by the same major label before they released the albums that we were we were making with them so we've experienced that you know so we wanted to to discuss those things we have in common but also find a common way forward mm-hmm. and and learn from each other so instead of succumbing to our very English traits of wanting to make ourselves smaller, which obviously is very much at odds with being a a music artist and performer. Instead of doing that, we thought, well, let's lean into it and let's tell our stories. Like, that's what we know best. So we want to make this podcast about what we've experienced in the industry, our own stories, and also our own attempts to find a new path forward because we're not about to give up. And just be authentic, you know. I think that authenticity was so important in those first couple episodes. I think I was a fish out of water because we were talking a lot, a lot of statistics and we were talking a lot of real industry stuff. And I, I'm an artist. I'm a song. I'm a songwriter. I'm a musician. Like I don't care about all that stuff. And that's why it's been such a difficult journey, you know, without all that, especially now the way that things have changed. And now that we've sort of found this very clear direction, uh, it feels more inspiring. It feels more hopeful. And I think that's a better place to come from. And like Matt said, there are already podcasts out there doing a great job and we didn't want to step on anyone's toes and get involved in something that's already being done so we wanted to find our own angle and so matt and i are going to go through this you know uncomfortable at times journey in trying to god i mean relaunch our careers in a way you know or at least re- restructured careers because everything has changed so much in the last five years or so with tiktok and algorithms and it, crazy amount of music that's released uh, on Spotify every day. Point being, we now have a little bit of focus and we want to bring you along for that ride, whether it's a success story or not, is to be determined. And um, I'm just sort of, I feel, I feel good about this, this new method that we're going to have. There's going to be some accountability there because if Matt challenges me to do something for the next episode, I'm going to look like a little bit of a dick if I don't do it. So... It's accountability to a whole listener base now. And one of the important things is we don't want to just make this about the music industry. If we, we don't want to just, you know, close it off to, to people who have been in the music industry and been chewed up by the industry. We, we would like music listeners to learn something and be interested in our stories and be involved in this. Um, and people who don't even know anything about our world, you know, we don't want to just close it off to an exclusive club of bruised musicians. For sure. Yeah. It really is about having a dream striving for that dream, getting so close to that dream and then feeling it, well, watching it evaporate right before your eyes. And then it's kind of how, what do you do then? You know, how do you pick yourself up after the knocks and how do you move forward? How do you find energy to do something you've done before to try and get back up to the the level that you were at before and beyond? It's, there's a lot of knockbacks in the music industry in particular. And um, there's a lot of picking yourself up, dusting yourself up and often starting again. And me and Greg are at a point where we felt a fair share of knockbacks each and we're, we have to do that again. We're excited to do that, but we thought maybe it would be more exciting to do it and document it along the way. We should really catch the listeners up, right, on yeah. our journeys. Like, how did we end up here? What happened? Yeah, the, the, the sort of highlight reels of, of how we are where we are and, you know, in the spirit of a podcast that we want you to come back to, why don't you get to know us both a little bit? Some of you may know me, some of you may know Matt. 
some of you may know us both. And if you're here and you know neither of us, then wow, uh, where did, how, did you, how did that happen? <laughs> we both could talk about ourselves probably quite easily because we are artists and are musicians. And we gave you a little high, highlight reel in the intro. But, you know, I would like to sort of casually and non-scripturally, scripturally, scriptedly, Talk about Matt because Matt is one of my favorite musicians and artists. He has a band called Belmont. Just put out a new the album's out now, Matt. The Did album's album, out. Yeah. It's out. called Mean World Mean World Syndrome. And it truly is a masterpiece. I think it's an absolutely beautiful album that um, is not getting the ears that it deserves, which is a common story and which is one of the reasons why we even started talking about making a podcast. You know, Matt, uh, I'm just gonna tell your story as best I can. Okay. You know, because I think it's nice when someone else says it. Made his album. Uh, you can correct me where I'm wrong as well, but he made this album uh, with a major label on a major label budget. So it sounds king incredible. The songs are beautiful. I, I happen to have one of the songs on the album that I wrote with Matt and a buddy of ours, Sean Van Vliet. But it's a, it's a beautiful album and it's, I, it blows my mind when, when friends make albums like this and they're not world famous. But that is a that is a, the difficulty of today's industries. As Matt informed me last week, there are a hundred thousand songs a day come out on Spotify. Hundred thousand. Think about that. One hundred thousand songs come out every single day on the streaming platforms. How the fuck does anyone sift through that? So Matt's sitting on this masterpiece record that barely anyone is hearing. So you know, that's a bummer, isn't it, Matt? It's a bit of a bummer, yeah. It's uh, it's a couple of years of work just making it, never mind writing it. It's probably five years of work in that record and a hell of a lot of money. Just released it. There's no part of the album that I listen to and go, oh, I wish I could change that or make that any different. So I'm in this position where I'm, I'm mega proud of the record, but beyond our like super fans, I'm struggling to get it even heard by even the people who listen to our most listened to song, you know, that song, Hollow. Um, it gets hundreds of thousands of listens every month. And I'm struggling to get those people to move on and listen to this new work, which I feel is my best work yet. So that's very difficult. Maybe it's nostalgia And I just can't forget you I'm a fool who can't remember The old me knew you better question for you Matt yeah do you think that it is a product of the people who love your music not being able to find you or do you think it's that they are so overwhelmed by the amount of music that is being shoved down their throats every day that they either a don't have time to listen to your new record or b are too burnt out to even try to you know does that make sense sometimes I wonder if people are sitting there they see like Greg Holden or Matt Belmont has a new album out, but like, oh God, I've, there's too much information. I'm too overwhelmed. There's too much music to listen to. Or do you think they just don't know? I have no idea that you have an album out. I think there's a disconnect between people who've heard our music and liked our music and the people who've done that and then found a, a channel to keep up to date with it. Um, so I think there's just so much going on and there's so much noise that for me to cut through the noise and reach them and even let them know that I have a new album um, is quite impossible without just paying for marquee ads on Spotify or Facebook ads yeah. um, and having a, like a really significant budget to do that. But also music has to find people now. People rarely find music. That's different with word of mouth. I think there is a whole word of mouth movement still. It just takes a while. And I was speaking to our friend Carrie Brothers about this recently. And he was saying that he doesn't think you can define an album as a success or a failure until around the 10 year mark. He feels like wow. if you're going to leave it up to word of mouth and just the power of that album in itself to find a route through. So you seed it out to the first thousand people if those thousand people love it and tell 10 people each, and that keeps happening over a period of five to 10 years, then you're going to have a, 
a hit album 10 years in, whether mm-hmm. you've put any ads behind it or TikToks or YouTube or um, any massive marketing budget behind it or not. He believes that the cream rises, but it takes 10 years. And it will have longevity too. You know, the slower it rises, usually the slower it is to come down too mm-hmm. and vice versa. So as always with Carrie Brothers, pearls of wisdom right there. We'll have to get him on at some point, won't we? Oh, we must. Okay, so we have talked about a few of your massive achievements, only a few. I know there are so many more that I'd love to get into over the course of this podcast. But yeah, and multiple number ones across multiple countries, amazing massive sinks on huge TV shows and on and on and on. I know Time Magazine wrote about you at one point. I guess what I'd like to do is bring it into the present, Greg, and and really find out what it's like being you now, but also kind of what brought you to this stage. What, What has been the arc of your story so far and where does it end up today? Well, at the risk of telling a very long story, I'll tell a slightly long story. My career started on YouTube way back when, in 2008, 9. Started posting videos of me singing new songs that I'd just written. Slowly but surely, people started paying attention and the numbers started going up. And I, you know, all of a sudden I had a fan base. I'd never had a fan base before. I had people asking me questions about me and my music and it was cool. It felt really nice. That turned into a sort of smallish touring career where I could go play people's living rooms and some clubs in and around Europe and, and in, in England, which then turned into opportunities in America, which took me to New York, where I've always wanted to live. That was my dream. I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan. I always wanted to live in New York. And in 2009, I actually moved there to start my music career. It was terrifying, but also not terrifying at all because I knew I was doing the right thing for myself and my career. So I started playing shows in New York and people started showing up. And then labels started showing up and I made an independent album through Kickstarter, actually. I think that was around 2010 with a dream producer, dream band album called I Don't Believe You, which I'm still incredibly proud of. And throughout that time, I saw numbers rising. I saw progress, which is what you want to see when you're working hard on something. You, you want to see more people showing up to your shows. You want to see more people downloading your album because back in the, that time, that was iTunes. You know, people downloaded your album. There was a chart system there. there was, you could see your success. So I carried on. I kept touring. I kept playing. I kept releasing music. And ultimately that led to, in 2014, I signed a deal with a major label. Reluctantly in the beginning, but in the end, I'm glad I did. Uh, And the president of the company himself actually signed me and there was a lot of buzz around me and it was going to be the next rock and roll star. I was going to be the next Tom Petty. You know, they were throwing money at me. We're making videos. I made it, you know, I'd already made the album actually independently, but I sold it back to the label regrettably um and they uh threw money at me and 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 they well at at my project not at me and it was awesome i'll be totally transparent it was it was amazing i traveled the world i played everywhere i made music videos with actors in them i i the celebrities were reaching out there was this whole thing building around me and i felt like i was becoming a success story i had a number one hit i forgot to mention that i wrote a song called home um Totally forgot, just totally glossed over that. The biggest thing that's happened in my life. I wrote a number one hit. It was recorded by a guy called Philip Phillips and the song was called Home. And it was a huge, huge song and changed my life completely. Continues to, you know, give me a good life. So all this was happening all around the same time. And it was, it was so cool. And I won an award and I was at an award. I played a show, uh, an awards ceremony and Tom Petty was in the front row and I met him and he told me I was awesome, (laughs) you know, and like, (laughs) Tom Hanks was reaching out on fucking Instagram. It was just, it was, I felt like the dream that I had dreamt of my whole life was coming true. And it it was, you know, it's a bummer now because I'm looking back on it and it's like, fuck, that was such an amazing time. Um, it was so cool and it really was. And it was really like, I, I think my feet were still on the ground, but I was definitely floating. And um, more and more amazing opportunities were presenting themselves. And I, I, I ended up touring with Brandy Carlisle and she and I actually sang one of my songs together during her set. And it was really great. And just touring, 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 traveling the world, feeling like a rock star, totally feeling like a rock star until the breaks just something happened with the way that people consume media and music and information with social media. And, and the rug just got pulled out from, from all of us um, streaming and, and, I don't want to go too deep into it, but basically it felt like just everyone hit a wall and I got dropped or a lot of my friends got dropped. People at the labels got fired and there was just this change, this monumental change in the way that people made music, got signed. I mean, it it was just, it felt like it went from authentic art, authentic art, authentic art to 
the next day, TikTok kids who don't know anything about music being signed to major record labels and having money thrown at them. And then, uh, and that's, that was what we had to now deal with. And so the last five years, I'll be transparent again, it felt kind of shitty. And, and, and there isn't like a progress that I'm seeing in my career. It's, it has actually felt kind of like I haven't really changed a great deal in the way that I'm operating, but my career is slowly dying. <laughs> um, and I believe that I'm making the best art that I have ever. And I still am trying to do it, but I've, I've run into a lot of roadblocks, a lot of obstacles, a lot of walls that are now up that uh, a lot of it is out of our control. And that's one of the reasons Matt and I started this podcast was to sort of delve into that. Again, I don't want to go too deep, but I'm experiencing a lot of resistance in the industry that I've known so much about for so long um, that I now feel like a stranger and I feel like I'm being blocked out of. So to answer Matt's question, <laughs> I'm still making music, I'm still recording music right here in this very room uh, that I'm very proud of. But I'm trying to figure out how to get people to listen to it. As Matt said, we both have, you know, some success. We have millions of people listen to our music, have thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of listeners. And we are not only having a hard time reaching people with our music, we are having a hard time reaching people that already have signed up to hear from us. You know, <laughs> it's, it's almost impossible to reach the people who already agreed to be, to be bombarded by us. The, uh, the algorithms just don't let it happen anymore. So, we're reaching a fraction of the people that know who we are. So the idea of even trying to reach people who don't know who we are is, it feels impossible. And I guess that's why we are here, Matt, is to yeah. document ourselves figuring out ways to, to progress and to, and to continue to succeed in our, in our ever-evolving industry. I don't want to be the one to lose his only son. Cause some selfish psycho could not control his rage Oh, and it seems like everywhere we go The winds of violence blow And I can't promise that I can keep you safe And I can feel it Feel it push me down There was one moment that I wanted to, to touch in on because I remember when I first met you and you told me the story of when you went on tour to the UK as an independent artist, I believe. And just before the end of the tour, you got a call from your manager about a potential opportunity to have your song featured in a pretty massive TV show, a TV talent show. The way you painted the picture to me when you told me was as though you barely had two pennies to rub together at the time. And then you got on the plane, got back to your apartment, and you grabbed a beer and you sat on the sofa and you watched your song win American Idol. Can you talk on that at all? I can. Yeah, that was a very... Um... I just got chills actually. It's funny because funny, it really was a, like a turning point in my life. Um, I was sitting in a radio station in Holland, having just had a number one song in Holland of my own called The Lost Boy. And I had sold out a tour across the country, a very small country, but nevertheless sold out. <laughs> and I'd been on this nine week tour. I mean, I'd been in Germany, I'd been in the UK, I'd been in Holland, I'd been in Sweden, I'd gone everywhere. I was exhausted and I was broke. I'd spent way more money than I'd made on the tour. And I'd put in so much work. And I was sitting in this chair. I remember sitting in this chair in the studio about to go on the air, just so pissed off, so disillusioned. And, and I mean, this was 2014. I was like, how do people do this? I just had this tour and there was people here and I toured in a car, man. I wasn't even, I wasn't like I was in a bus or with like a full band and a crew. I was like, in a car with two of my buddies. It wasn't even like a glamorous tour. And yeah, I'd still lost money. And I was just thinking like, how the fuck do people do this? And I was sitting there and my phone rang and it's my manager. And he, he said, bit of a random one, but American Idol wants to use uh, Home 
and Home was a song that I'd written maybe a year before with a guy in LA called Drew Pearson that I didn't really like all that much, to be honest. I really, I mean, it was fine. It was, and I'd happened to be playing it on the road on that tour because I needed a happy song because my set was so damn depressing. But I'd been playing Home actually on that tour. He said, they want to use it on American Idol. I was like, what? What the fuck? <laughs> Have they heard the song? You know? And it was like, Jimmy Iovine wants to use it. And I, I'm a huge Tom, Fe- Tom Petty fan, right? So D- Tim, Jimmy Iovine, I think he, uh, Damn the Torpedoes was the, son- the album that he produced with fucking, right. uh, you know, come on. <laughs> so I was like, what the fuck? Why did they want to use that song? It doesn't even have a chorus. It was so, it was so weird. I couldn't believe it. But anyway, of course I approved it because I was broke out of my ass and I, and, and I didn't know it was even going to, they weren't paying me to use the song. I mean, I would eventually get paid if the song did well, but there was no money up front. Right. Yeah, like so no licensing like, fee. No licensing fee or anything like that. So I was like, what does that mean? And my manager's like, I don't, I don't know, but they, it's in the finale. He's like, so people will listen to it. So I was like, all right, approved. Cause I have to approve it. Cause I wrote it obviously. So yeah, then I, you know, I went on the radio station, <laughs> played a couple of songs, got on a plane the next day and flew home. Um, I didn't not think about it because of course I thought about it, but it wasn't like I knew really what it meant. And I remember actually went, before I went home that night, I, got, I landed in New York. That's where I used to live. And I went to Rockwood Music Hall um, because my buddy was playing that night. So before I went home, I actually went to Rockwood. And I met a couple of people and they were like, what's going on with you? Like, what have you been doing? I said, ah, you know, I think... I think uh, my song's going to be on American Idol tomorrow. And they're all like, wow. <laughs> you know, it's this weird thing. And anyway, then I went home and it's funny because I got home and, oh yeah, yeah, that was what happened. It was the night before. So I, yeah, I went to New- I went to Rockwood. I went, hung out, told some people. And the next day was when it was going to be on the TV. But I just couldn't quite believe it because I was like, American Idol is a huge fucking show. Yeah. So I was like, I don't really, uh, I can't really fathom how this is going to be a thing. But my buddy from Australia was arriving, I remember. So he 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 kind of came in the door like a couple of minutes before they played it on the air. So I had a couple of beer, I had some beers in my hand and he, he came in the door and it, he's like, how's it, how's it going, mate? You know, whatever the fuck they say in Australia. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> sorry, sorry, buddies. Good eye, I know mate. so many Australians. I know so many Australians. That's going to be so offensive. But anyway, he came in the door and he's like, what's going on? I said, oh, I think my song's about to be on TV. And he's like, what? Everybody's reaction is, what? Yeah. Um, so anyway, I gave him a beer and we turned the TV on and there it was. He, it was Philip Phillips playing home in the finale of American Idol. And it was crazy. They had this, what was crazy actually is what they used my backing vocals. They used my guitar track. They used the track that me and Drew made. It was all completely mimed. And I was like, that's my voice. And he's singing the song and then this marching band comes on and there's this confetti everywhere and it's this huge, huge and none of the none of the viewers have heard this song along the series. It's the first time it's been. Yes, yeah, the first time aired. they're hearing this song, and right. everyone's you know Jennifer Lopez or whoever it was just like standing up and clapping, and I'm just looking at the TV, and my buddy's looking at me like, <laughs> he's like, you wrote you wrote this, and I was, I, I've got to stop doing the Australian accent. And I'm like, yeah, I did. And then anyway, he there's a vote. There's a vote. You have to cast a vote. So there's a it was the finale. So it was against this other girl's song, and um, he won. <laughs> And I remember the moment when it was like, and the winner is, and it said, Philip Phillips. And I was sitting in my living room in Brooklyn, just like, well, I didn't have a living room in Brooklyn. Sorry, let me rephrase that. I was sitting in my one room apartment in Brooklyn and was like, what the fuck does this mean? You know, I was like this, I think this is big. So what's funny is the song immediately went to number one in, in the USA. And I was like, and it was that night. And I was like, I think... I think I have a number one song in America. <laughs> and then all hell broke loose. So then um, I was broke for another year. <laughs> really? Because it took that pay, long? Yeah, it, it took a year for the money to come through. So I was like, everywhere I went, man, I was in a cab in New York, song was on. Walked into a bar, song was on. Every single place I went, that song was haunting me. It was everywhere. And I was broke. I even went uh, a few weeks later to see John Mayer, uh, the Brooklyn Arena, which is around the corner from my house, the Barclay Arena, and Philip Phillips was opening for him, and he played his whole set, and at the end he played home, and the whole arena. I, I don't. This is no disrespect, to Philip Phillips, but the, the arena was pretty quiet through his through his set. Like they, they were just sort of doing their thing and like mm-hmm. you know getting their hot dogs or whatever and chilling and kind of watching the music, but no one was really doing much because nobody really knew anything about Philip Phillips until he played home, and the entire arena stood up and they started singing. Wow. And I was sitting in this arena just like with my buddy in these seats. The funny thing is the label didn't even give me good seats. They gave me like shitty <laughs> seats. <laughs> I was sitting in this arena like, this is fucking crazy. 
like no one in this arena knows that I wrote this song. Except my buddy's now yelling, he wrote this song, he wrote this song, he wrote this song. <laughs> I wrote this song. It was crazy. Totally crazy. And then, you know, a lot happened after that. And then a year later, I got checks that I had only dreamed of in my whole life. You know, I finally got paid and it was beautiful. <laughs> For a broke Northern English songwriter who's mm. spent his entire life broke, it was, it was life-changing. Totally, totally life-changing. A number one in America. I mean, that is the ultimate, the ultimate dream, the ultimate dream, but also the ultimate pot of gold, right? I know, I know. Well, so if it had been in the nineties, I'd be, li I'd be living on a private island right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Instead, it was not. Matthew, uh, I know. I just talked a lot about myself, which I don't love doing, but you forced me to do it. I know a lot about your career. I know all about you as a person, and I think you're one of the most talented musicians I know. But the listener doesn't. The listener does not know. And, you know, we, Matt and I were both signed to the, the same label. We were the same publisher. We both had very similar trajectories in our career. And we're both lined up for huge careers. <laughs> but I want Matt to sort of bring me up to speed with where he's at now because I know there's been some setbacks, to say the least. And uh, it's important that you talk about them and, and let people know what's going on and why things are going on. Matt, tell us a little bit about how you got from the north of England to my living room in Los Angeles, <laughs> California. <laughs> wow. We're going back. Really, it started with, with writing my own songs and, and busking my way through university, a busking career that lasted seven or eight years. Explain to the American listeners what busking is. Busking is going out into a street that never asked you to be there with a guitar and an amp and a microphone. <laughs> And, uh, and playing songs for the people walking by and hoping that they'll throw a few pennies in your case. Got a, a whole load of gigs off the back of that, like weddings, bars, corporate gigs. I played at the Amazon function in the UK where Alexa was announced. <laughs> they used my wow. microphone to, sh to do a product demo for Alexa to the Amazon That's staff. Um, and nobody cared. Everybody was <laughs> drunk. Everybody talked over Alexa. The guy who'd been working his ass off making this very first Alexa thing. Um, oh, God, I can't say that. If I say that word over and over again on a podcast, it's going to be like... Oh, bloop, yeah. Bloop. Hey, Alexa, play Belmont. Okay, Google. Um, oh, shit, Google's just... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I did that kind of thing. But the whole time was just to sustain myself in writing my own music. So in the background, I was writing my own songs. And eventually, one of those songs found its way to Nashville, to a producer in Nashville called Femka, who'd recently won uh, like a Latin Grammy Award and had worked with a few different people but was trying to make a name for herself as well um, in America. She heard one of my songs and reached out and asked me if I wanted to come write with her. Which song was it? It was a song that you, that's never come out. It was called Backpedaling. It kind of had the sound of Belmont and it had my voice and it had elements of what I do but just it wasn't a complete thing so we never released it and she wanted me to come out and co-write with her in Nashville at the time I was like I was swamped in cover gigs my original music didn't feel like it was going anywhere I was running an open mic night in London that I'd run for a few years and I was trying to just like bang on the door multiple doors I did a little bit of writing for Universal Music I did a little bit of writing for various artists around London nothing had really landed so I didn't have this like constant upward trajectory at all to that point it just felt like banging on doors that wouldn't open really i got this break with someone who was mutually trying to make their name and who was incredibly talented i remember i was renovating my flat at the time covered in dust and i remember finding like the one jumper that wasn't covered in dust throwing it on sitting in one corner of of the flat that we'd painted while the rest was just a tip and just putting my headphones on oh yeah yeah i'm just coming out of a writing session <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. I can just squeeze you in. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't do that, but I, I at least pretending my life wasn't chaos. And she was sat there with her manager and they said some really nice things about my music and invited me to Nashville. That was the first place you went to in America? The first place I went to for music in America, anyway. Yeah, I'd yeah. been to Disneyland and things when I was younger. Yeah. But I remember going to an Airbnb on the outside of Nashville and sitting on their piano and just like writing a song on the first day because she was busy on the first day. And then we were going to meet on the Monday night. And I wrote the chorus to this song called Made to Find You. And then the next day we met up and we, we finished that song, Made to Find You. And on the second day, we wrote a song called Hollow on day two of writing together. And we were just off. We just had this incredible co-writing chemistry. We wrote, I think, 10 songs, wrote and demoed 10 songs in 10 days. Wow. 
And I was like, wow, I'm onto something. We showed them to our manager. I didn't have a manager at the time. He loved it. I went back a couple of months later, wrote more songs, crashed a rental car, <laughs> six minutes into no having shit. it, wrote it off. Um, oh, shit. Yeah, that's a whole other story. But um, Oh, my God. Uh, ended up back in Nashville, writing more songs, but also playing a showcase and just getting this crazy reaction. Everybody who heard me sing and play was like, where's this guy been? Like, really loving what they were hearing, sending messages to her manager, who then became my manager for a brief time. And we recorded a production of that song. We recorded between like the neighbor's dog barking and the lawnmower going off, like a very DIY. Uh, mm -hmm. But she's an incredible producer. She did an amazing job despite all that. We had no money. And uh, we found a distributor and we started putting the music out and song one just exploded the first song um and i had released like solo singer songwriter self-produced eps and things in the past never to much success i had a little bit of like you know the itunes singer songwriter chart mm -hmm. back in 2012 i had like top five or something on there and uh, a few little things few little moments on radio but nothing massive and yeah hollow came out and was on new music friday usa which was like the playlist to be on in 2017 when it came out mm -hmm. It's a beautiful song. I mean, for those who haven't heard it, that, go check that song out immediately because that is a gorgeous, gorgeous song. People just took to it. I had a mahogany session, which helped the success as well, and just garnered this fan base. And it was just me and Femcro at the beginning. But uh, we finished the EP. We got Chris and Ben in to play the drums and guitar and released the whole EP. And song after song was just New Music Fridays, New Music Fridays, acoustic hits, pop Amazing. hits, all these big playlists. And before we knew it, Hollow had a few million streams. And our distributor said, you know, people really are loving acoustic music right now. You should do an acoustic version of Hollow. So I went and met up with Femke's boyfriend at the time, now her husband, Josh Reynolds. And um, we spent a couple of hours recording an acoustic version of Hollow. And yeah, just like smoked some weed, had a few beers, knocked this acoustic version out in his living room, released it. And it just like, I thought Hollow had exploded, but Hollow Acoustic just went insane to the point where it's got, I think, 40 million streams today. Wow. And ended up signing with... Uh, this manager who managed a band called Kaleo, who I was a big fan of at the time. And he got me a publishing deal with Warner Chapel. And that was when I got sent doing the rounds, writing with everyone and anyone. And mm, one of everyone and anyone was uh, Mr. Greg Holden. I like how you came all the way around, right back into my living room. Right back into your living room, yeah. And we hit it off, right? And we wrote a couple of songs that first trip. We did. But yeah, I just remember, like you said, numbers going up, everything going right. Like, so 2019 was a year of showcase festivals, South by Southwest, Eurosonic mm -hmm. Festival, Reaper Barn Festival, the Great Escape Festival, supporting Kaleo on tour, opening up um, a big festival in Germany to 14,000 people. It was headlined by Michael Moore. And then eventually getting signed to a major record label in um, February 2020. And the plan was to make the album in May. It was written. Um, and then go on tour for six months supporting Kaleo around the world, UK, Europe, North America, Canada. And then we know what happened. I remember actually getting a taxi to the airport in uh, mid-February. It was like a disaster movie. The radio was on. And I remember hearing the first cases of a new virus uh, have been detected at LAX airport as I was driving towards LAX. And I was like, oh, that's a bit weird. That kind of just felt it immediately struck me. I got out mm -hmm. of the taxi, got my flight home. And a month later, the world shut down um, a month after I'd signed my record deal. Yeah, all those plans went out the window. So we did what we could. We remotely produced an EP over Zoom, I had Hollow come to radio. But it went to radio at a time when everyone was staying home. No mm -hmm. one was in their cars. Everybody listens to radio in their cars. And all the radio stations had gone to a very conservative approach of playing majority like catalog music that people recognized, that comforted people, and not really taking chances on new artists. So it made the top 20 charts. I think it peaked at like number 18 on the radio charts, um, which is definitely a success, but the label were aiming for number one. Yeah, We followed that up a few months later with Famous Son. I think that got like number 26 or something like that. And then finally, February 2022 came around, and that was when... We were due to finally go on this six-month tour that had been delayed two years. Finally promote the whole thing. We were finishing our, our album. And yeah, we were just, we were ready to freight our stuff to America the next morning. And I went to my producer's house to have like a meal to kind of celebrate finishing the record. And I got a call from management. So I answered the call and my manager went, well, Matt, so this is the hardest call that we ever have to make to any of our artists. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is going on? 
Um, so we've been trying to get the tour support released by your label for the last few weeks and we've been back and forth and haven't been able to get them to do so and eventually they've decided they don't want to pay for the tour anymore um, and they've decided to drop you and terminate your contract. I then had to absorb that and then... Um, it's like being fired, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, well, it's kind of like being dumped yeah. by someone who doesn't give you closure because... Totally. You go from like the last, but the last time I saw you, like you were kissing me and we were in love and now you've packed your bags and you're gone and you don't yeah. want to give me an explanation. It's like that because the last meeting is like, whoa, loving what we're, we've heard. We love this yeah. song for radio and great job, guys. Just keep doing your thing. You're killing it. This tour is going to be amazing. We just have to get you in rooms. We just have to get you heard. And in fact, just to give a bit more context, that morning I'd woken up and looked at my phone, scrolled Instagram, and I'd gotten to the Instagram account of my record label and they'd put out a press release talking about how they'd made record profits that quarter and they were paying a dividend of around $80 million for the quarter to their shareholders. <laughs> so I was like, oh, great news. My record company's in good financial health. <laughs> this should be fine. Um, and then got dropped that evening because they didn't want to pay for the tour support. So... Fucking so yeah, nonsense. that was rough, man. And then I had to go and tell my band who'd quit their job and moved their house and, oh. and done all these things thinking they were going on tour in 10 days' time. That's just so brutal, man. I remember you calling me too, just telling me what happened. And it was like, I, could, I felt so bad for you. I mean, <laughs> also because I kind of knew, I mean, my scenario wasn't as crazy as yours because I wasn't going on a tour for a, the rest of my life. <laughs> um <laughs> 86 dates, but man. You don't forget. I mean, 86 dates. That's like, because you told me you were going to move to Nashville at the end of the tour and everything. Mm -hmm. Like you were about to upend your entire life and they just fuck you right there. And you have no chance to even, it's crazy, man. I mean, it's crazy that they can do that. And, and just without, I mean, no, look, no offense to anyone at the record labels themselves. They're all just doing the job. They're all just trying totally. to stay afloat, stay afloat themselves. And I think we were assigned to the same record label and I loved everybody at my label. But the last time I went into my label building out, my pictures of my face were everywhere, yeah. all over the building, <laughs> yeah. you know? And then one day I just get a call. That's, I remember where I was. I remember what I was wearing. You know, it was like, you dumped, you know, it's, it, that's kind of like, you just nailed it. It's like, you dumped with no closure. Did you get a call from your my manager? My manager called me. Same. Yeah, my manager calls me and he's like, so, because um, I was about to go make my second album with a guy called Butch Walker. I was, we'd already been in the studio together. We'd already mm -hmm. started and... You know, my manager, my ex-manager's like, so yeah, um, the label's dropping you and we now have to pay for the album ourselves. I'm like, hmm, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> uh, and it's so weird. You feel so betrayed. You know, the last time you're in that building, everyone's just like, you know, tickling your testicles. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden you're gone. And it's just you're like, what the fuck? Does that mean I don't have a job now? Now I don't, I don't get it. Like, I don't. It's hard because so, it becomes it becomes personal and I don't mean that in kind of anger or anything. I'm, I kind of mean like your relationships with the people you work with at the label become personal. Like you like Yeah, them. I was They're so close friends. to so many people at my label. And you have an so A&R and you have like a marketing person, a PR person and you're like, I like them all. It's like family. I, like I would go stay at my uh, radio guy's house like yeah. in, the, in the Hamptons. Like he, he would like let me stay at his house and stuff and like when he wasn't there, you know, mm. we were like family they work for this big entity and it's kind of like it would be frowned upon for them to, to call you up and in that moment maybe you get a couple of instagram dms or a text saying just heard really sorry to hear it but yeah it's kind of like it's the fact that it happens through your manager as well i had an a and r at the company and I, who i was talking to more than my manager at that time you know i was talking to her about the songs she was giving advice on which ones she liked and what she'd like to hear from the album and helps me pick which songs went on the album. And, and then I've, I haven't heard from her since. I've never heard from her again. So crazy. Ever again. So like not a text, nothing, which I just found wild. I was like, wait a second. Like we got on, right? Like, didn't we get on? Like it's, we don't have to, like I can be grown up about the fact that this didn't work out, but like, yeah, let's just still be people. But then there are still, there are people who still work at the label who have like reached out every time I've released something. They've listened to it. They, they still follow. They, some of them are still subscribed to my mailing list. Lovely people who are in yeah. this because they love music. Um, it's just so this... no disrespect to the staff at record labels. Just to be just to be clear, it's more the machine itself is a little bit broken, but the people that work there are all wonderful. And I don't I don't have any shit things to say about anybody at the labels themselves. 
Totally. But at the same time, like, I mean, I don't think we've said anything shit. We've just told our stories right now. And it's yeah. like, sometimes it feels, it feels rough to, I don't know. I feel like it's hard to tell your story honestly and not, um, and not feel like you're doing something wrong, you know, because it's kind of yeah. like, oh, if you got dropped, don't ever see you get dropped. Because if you, if people hear that you've been dropped, they won't want to, you'll not get signed again because then you'll be damaged yeah. goods and you'll have been dropped. And I'm like, nah, the industry's changed now. Yeah. We got dropped. It doesn't make us any less great. Everybody gets dropped. Everybody gets dropped now anyway. You know? Exactly. Everybody I'm not sure I know dropped. anyone who still has a record deal, to be honest. Good name for dropped. Dropped the podcast. Dropped. Yeah, that's, yeah. Now that you know our stories, you know, a little bit more, hopefully you are still with us. And, uh, you know, our stories continue. Our careers continue. We are now in an industry that has changed dramatically since those things happened to Matt and I. Things have tra- changed dramatically, um, depending on your angle, for better or for worse. And in our cases, for the most part, worse. Not necessarily worse, but just that we, we don't get it anymore. Like we don't understand, like we get, we make great music. We are happy with the music we make. We feel like we're making the best music of our careers. But we used to know exactly how to get it out to the to mm-hmm. the people. Um, and now we are struggling to work that out. And that's the journey that we're on right now. We're, yeah. Now it's a mystery. Yeah, we both had big knocks. We have both had big successes. We've kind of both had enough success to know that we're great at what we do. And, and mm-hmm. that's not about boasting or anything it's just like you've got to believe in yourself in an industry that that chews you up and spits you out sometimes you've got to be your own biggest fan we now have to pick ourselves up dust ourselves off and find a route through and that's what we're about to do and we're going to find some ways to cut through the noise while remaining true to the core of who we are as artists and not Mm. suddenly starting to dance on tiktok how are we going to do that greg that's going to be part of the challenge i think i mean i'm generally pretty pessimistic about the social media age that we're in and what people do to get attention and what people have to do to get attention. The the YouTube thumbnails now are so fucking obnoxious and the TikTok dancing makes me sick with just just discomfort. And I'm like, is this what I have to do? Like, is this how I get people to listen to my music now? Like, surely not. But this podcast is, you know, documenting that that challenge and that journey because both Matt and I have integrity with our art, you know, go listen to our music. It's, it's there, you know, it's, uh, I'm not, I'm not ashamed or embarrassed to say that I think my music's great and I think it should be heard by more people. And if I didn't believe that, then what the fuck am I doing? The question is how now, like Matt said, there used to be a method. There used to be a way that we did it. There was a, there was a roadmap. Well, that roadmap is a slot machine now. That's what yes. that roadmap is. It used to be right. a kind of like, do this, 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 and, and expect these results mm-hmm. if people connect with your music. Now it's just like, pull on the slot machine and hope that the gods select you. Um, or that's how it seems. And I, I would like to believe that it isn't so much that. And there's a lot of resistance, you know, on my end. I'll just speak for myself. There's a lot of resistance to join a lot of these things. I don't have TikTok currently, and I have a feeling that's going to be one of the challenges that Matt sets for me. I'm I'm a little bit, I guess what some might say, old school at this point. I do have social media. You know, I'm good. I'm I used to feel like I was good at it. I make cool videos and art, but I'm not quite on like the the cutting edge of of all the of, of all the algorithmic shit. And I don't necessarily want to be either because it just requires such a, a sacrifice of time and uh, integrity that I'm just not really on board. But I do want a successful career still. I want to be able to pay my mortgage and give my son a good life. And I got to figure out how to find a balance, you know, being part of what's going on and, and evolving with technology and also remaining true to what I want to do and not dancing around like a fucking idiot on the, on TikTok. <laughs> the key seems to be authenticity, like brutal authenticity. And it's finding a way to do that in short form, you know? And I think the mistake that a lot of people who don't understand the platforms make is they try to make something really polished or they're stuck in Instagram mindset and they think filters Mm -hmm. and color grading and and just too try hard. The people on those platforms are sick of all the noise and they want to feel like someone has just turned their camera on and started speaking from the heart. And every time you try to find a formula to go viral, it seems to be beaten by the person who was really feeling something in a moment and pressed record in that moment. Mm Mm-hmm clear authenticity and yeah you don't yeah. want to leave a three second pause at the beginning of the video and there's little things like that you can you can bear in mind and and put captions on your video because a lot of people watch on mute what i've basically learned 
is that you have to kind of find a way to authentically present the superhero version of yourself. Like, show your superpower. People want to, when coming to Greg Holden, they want to hear your lyrics, they want to hear your songs, they want to hear you sing and watch you play guitar. Otherwise, one, you risk not appealing to the people who actually like Greg Holden. And two, you risk appealing to people who like you for something you don't even want to be known for. <laughs> yeah. If you start telling jokes and suddenly you become the most successful comedian on TikTok, you've still failed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be the challenge of, of this podcast. And, and that's what this podcast is. You guys watching me and Matt blaze our way through all these, you know, red flags. <laughs> we appreciate you being here. Totally. We definitely both reached a point where we could have said, okay, this isn't for me. I had my shot and it all evaporated and went up in flames. And I can't be bothered to start again and go back and build from that point again. So therefore, I'm going to look elsewhere. Don't think I haven't thought about quitting a million times. However, this is my one natural given talent is writing music so, and singing. So I, I really, I have to succeed at this. You know, I've, I've dedicated all my life to this. More than half of my life has been dedicated to being a professional musician. So at this point, I haven't got a choice. I got to keep fucking going. Same. Yep. I've got a new record, a brand new album that I've poured everything into and I believe it needs to reach some ears. So my mission in this podcast is to is to work out a way to do that. And like I found a way in 2017 and beyond and uh, I'm going to find the way in 2024. Um, and Greg has got a whole batch of new music and he's determined to do the same. So challenges, Greg. We said we would, yes. we would challenge each other and we're going to push each other out of our comfort zones. I haven't truly posted on social media in the last in the last month really i've gone a bit quiet so that's the context for me on social media right now and i know that you don't have a tiktok account so i don't my challenge don't. for you this week is to set up a greg holden tiktok account Fuck. and post two videos on it i want you to find two? an old yeah i want you to find an old bit of content that you can find like a 30 second a one minute highlight of um Fuck. Add captions to it and post it. And I want you to um, to speak to the camera and uh, announce yourself as a musician. Fucking hell. Yeah. But, but you've got All to right. optimize it for TikTok, right? So no pauses at the beginning. Straight in on word number one. Cut all the meat. And also remember that on TikTok, you are broadcasting to people who have no clue who you are, right? Oh, God. So I you have to, to contextualize thing. yourself. Be that with like some writing on the screen or be that with what you say. I want to be sick. Fucking hell. All right. Well, my challenge to you then, Mr. Clean Cut Perfect Video Boy, <laughs> stick your phone in front of your body and sing a song from your beautiful album and put it on Instagram. Like no with no context, no, no story, no processing. just no processing. Well, you can process it. You can color process Yeah, you can process it. Make it look yeah. nice because I know that's on brand. I don't want to. I don't want to completely. You know, Matt has a very, very specific, beautiful, well-designed brand. I don't want to fuck all over that. However, <laughs> nice and raw, man. You can use microphones. You can use microphones. Just post a video, acoustic performance. You said it yourself. Hollow, the acoustic version went through the roof, um, mm. and there's a reason for that. It's because your voice is phenomenal and you play beautifully and you are a great performer. So, I have faith that if you post a, a beautiful acoustic performance. People will enjoy the shit out of it. That's funny that you say that because I've been doing everything but that. I've been experimenting with short form video and kind of, I think the mistake I've been making is doing everything but doing what you're actually supposed to do. Everything but my superpower <laughs> for so long. That's the problem with that's the problem with this shit is no one's doing what they're actually supposed to be doing. We're all busy trying to be fucking social media experts and entertainers. Where we're just we're singers. Exactly, that's what yeah. we're supposed to do. Sing. So go do that, and I'll. I'll do the opposite, I suppose. Okay, I'll get on to that and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll catch up next week. Yeah, we'll report back and, uh, you know, see if either of us did the challenge, which we will. And uh, we'll, we'll, keep you, we'll keep you up to date with how it goes and we'll see, you, uh, we'll see you here for episode two. Please spread the word. We love you. We appreciate you. We'll talk soon. Talk soon. Good luck with that little Tiki Talk account. <laughs> If you want these podcasts early and ad free, because who likes ads? Consider becoming a patron of ours at patreon.com forward slash dropped podcast. 
You can also email us at droppedpod at gmail.com and follow us on Instagram and threads at droppedpodcast. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.